Um, so, as you know, um, I'm going to be doing my research into uh, monogamy in the gay community. So, um, what are your initial thoughts on that subject matter? Just first things that come to your mind. When you talk about a subject as massive as monogamy within the gay community, you really you've really got incredibly broad brush approach to something that is incredibly complicated and individual that's like saying well it's like saying looking at monogamy within the straight community it, you know it's 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 the world that you're talking about but it is interesting that when you say that looking at monogamy in the gay community let, let's let's say that we're looking at the UK community, just to bring a frame in a bit, let's not look at the entire world because I can only even slightly speak about something that I'm used to and I understand and I have some experience of the gay community in Hebden Bridge and Brighton which are two of the allegedly gayest places in this country um, and although it is such a broad sweeping area to say to, to look at monogamy in the gay community there is something that generally comes up quite quickly about there's perhaps more of an issue with monogamy in the gay community talking about gay blokes rather than the lesbian scene which i think is a distinction that has to be made i don't think that's what you're looking at is it no. so when you say the gay community that let's be clear we're talking about same-sex male relationships in the UK that brings the frame in straight away then there's a lot of things that we don't have to look at and this is where you get into I mean this is where I find myself in contentious grounds really because all I can talk about is my experience and um, my my experience and my instinct about it so there is something different for me about men and women generally uh, as a stereotype we're talking about stereotypes and generalizations there's a really cliched thing that says that women out of wanting out of wanting a relationship with a man will sometimes have sex with them men out of wanting sex with a woman will sometimes have a relationship with them I think that's quite funny and there's definitely some truth in that now once you start putting men and men together there's a whole nother issue for me around male and female energy in relationships which I don't think is necessarily anything to do with gender or sexuality actually I think if you've got two very dominant people in a relationship it's a bit tricky or two very passive people in a relationship it's a bit tricky so generally what happens in a relationship dynamic, this is just my point of view, is that somebody becomes a slightly more dominant uh, character in some ways, not necessarily always. It might be in the bedroom, it might be in the kitchen, it might be shopping, it might be just who chooses what TV programmes you watch. It could be lots of things. So, like I remember one of, one of my gay best mates telling me a little bit about his life and it was a real surprise to me so he was like Hampstead Heath on an average weekday night I can go for a walk and I've got the choice of around a thousand blokes I can have a little have a little look wander into a bush if I don't like the size of it or I'm not interested I literally just walk off without a word being exchanged between us I'm like wow that is that is amazing and then he came down to visit me for a party once in brighton and he was looking a bit bored and he went where is it then doug i went what do you mean the gay cruising zone i don't know neil it's some bloody bushes in kemp town for all i know I don't, I don't really know i can't advise you there and he went i'm just gonna go for a little wander I'm like right fine came back at seven in the morning after having had an orgy under the arches met somebody spent a romantic night on the marina on a yacht looking at the stars had breakfast and came home i'm like that's my yearly allocation you've just had in a night so that's not fair now 
you know, there's two sort of lots of cliches in both of those stories. But I think that the reality for a gay bloke is if you're a little bit out there and you know how to do that thing, then sex is very easily available pretty much 24-7, seems to be the case. Now, I know that's a cliche, and I'm not saying that that is the way that it is. It seems like it's more how it is for gay blokes than it is for even women and women or women and, women and blokes. I mean, the straight scene's kind of catching up now. I mean, t you know, Tinder is a very direct copy of Grinder. You know, the straight scene is beginning to catch up with that, actually, you don't have to go through all that palaver of having a relationship to have sex if that's all you want. So I think the gay scene's led the way, whether it's a good way or not, that's a whole nother question. But promiscuity does seem to be quite hardwired into the, into the gay scene because it's just so easy. It's just so tempting. So then you put that into a relationship where you're with somebody, things aren't going so well, maybe you haven't had sex for a few weeks, you know, for for many people in that situation, you might have the thought about, oh, do you know what I mean? Could just do is scratching that itch, or so and so is giving me the eye, or whatever. But you wouldn't do anything about it. I think, I just think it's very easy, and I think that, in a way, is the issue. Whether it's a problem or not, that's a whole other thing. And whether you label it as pr promiscuous, which is kind of like a moral judgment about it, like I, I, to me, I sort of, to me, as far as I'm concerned, if it's consenting adults and r you know respectful and safe, then why put a moral judgment on it? I actually think that a lot of people would like to be a lot more promiscuous than they dare be. But that's a whole nother story. Anyway, what you're looking at is a stereotype that says it's difficult to be monogamous in a, in a same-sex gay male relationship. And then, so then you have a different experience of like, well, I've been with somebody for ages and what's annoying is that people assume that I might be like that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So then, but then what you also have begun to notice is that you actually have judgments about people who might be like that, or you have judgments. Everybody has judgments. And then, where do those judgments come from? I mean, for Lord's sake, have you seen what's gone on with pornography in this country in the last week? Have you seen the reg regulations? I mean, they've just banned a whole list of things from UK, British, produced pornography which includes I mean without getting into the detail here includes spanking now legal to produce in British pornography and female ejaculation male fine violent rape crime fine I mean who decides it's absolutely nonsense who decides this stuff about what's okay and what's not and it's very complicated times we live in. I mean, should something be done about an eight-year-old lad being able to watch a, somebody being shagged by a horse on their phone in the school playground? Yes, it should, because that's not right. Everybody knows that. But is what they've done anything to do with that? I really don't think it is. And some people might say, not me, I'm, I'm not saying this, some people might say, well, isn't it interesting that in a time when we've now discovered that there may be the possibility that young boys were taken to certain places and MPs did certain things for them is a story that is waiting to come out bubbling under. In the same couple of weeks, suddenly some regulations are changed around. I mean, I don't think that's I don't think that's a coincidence. We live in very complicated times around morality and very hypocritical times. So, how do you navigate around something that says? kill the paedophile on one page with an 18 year old girl with the tits out on the next page and the same newspaper it doesn't make any sense y you know and we've still got this even in today's news feed on my thing we've still got some you know american preacher saying that 
you know, Christmas would be better if all the gays died so AIDS wouldn't exist. Do you know what I mean? It's, we live in ridiculous times where, on the one hand, we, we understand something more about human nature through the internet, what people's, per people's personal preferences are, and what the adult world might be like behind closed doors. We understand more about it as a society now because of the internet. We didn't really know before. If you didn't know, how would you find out? Because it wasn't in anything. It wasn't in the magazines or papers or books what the gay scene was like or even what, you know, the adult sex scene was like. It just wasn't there. So we're kind of fledglings, really, in this world. We don't really know how to make sense of it all. And I personally think, and I do think this, in our country, we're very stuck in a kind of post-Victorian morality that is a hangover from a time when the church ruled the law and our morality and Victorian value, family values which were there on the surface and definitely weren't there behind closed doors a lot in Victorian times we're still hanging on to them but it doesn't really make any sense anymore so why, why does it even matter? Why does it even matter whether you're gay or straight or we're promiscuous or monogamous? Why is it even an issue? That's my question to you. Um, my, the question, you want me to answer that? Why is it an issue? To Not really, just think about it. The, just going back to um, what you mentioned about in the straight world, do you think people would like to be more promiscuous? Why do you think that they're not? See if that door's going to bang. That seems to be on a slow thingy. Um, well, I, I'm not saying that people. I'm not saying that people in the straight world would like to be more promiscuous. What I'm saying is, um, I think it's likely, and I don't know. I think it's likely that everybody has temptations. I think that would be a reasonable thing to say. What you do with those temptations for most people is tempered by the likely consequences of doing it. Whether you think that's a moral judgment or you get found out or God's going to punish you or you can't live with yourself, it doesn't really matter because you know, if I just go, all right, I'm going to chuck, I'm just going to chuck this mug over there and smash it because I feel like it. I'm in a bit of a bad mood today. Then that's a, an event, pretty straightforward. And then something's created that needs cleaning up. So then I've got, all right, I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to go and clean it up now, put it away and buy a new mug to replace it. And then that's a pretty straightforward set of events. It's sol solvable. But what if it's, I mean, this is a ridiculous example. What if it's somebody's <laughs> really favourite mug that they were given by their dying father as their last heirloom and I've just broken it, then it isn't repairable or replaceable. Oh, is that too ridiculous a comparison? What, what, what I'm trying to say is, there's a consequence to anything, any action. If you, if you look at the Bud Buddhist way of thinking, they call it karma and samsara you do something and the intention that you do it with creates a consequence for yourself that comes back round might seem like it comes from somebody else or from the universe or whatever so i think that's th i think that's the way it is there's always a consequence so even if you can get away with something you still got to live with yourself and then you're carrying a lie because if you're with somebody and you do something with somebody else even if you get away with it and nobody ever knows anything about it you know something about it and you know you've betrayed some kind of trust unless you're in a polygamous relationship or an open relationship where you've already had that conversation and you've got agreements about it so it seems to me that part of the issue is about human beings communicating what we want and what's okay and what's not and if that was clear 
and you say right well we're together we're a partnership but if you need to go off and scratch that itch every now and then I don't really need to know about it I'm giving you permission do what you want just be safe and come back home and then that's kind of different isn't it I mean but that involves a lot of maturity and a lot of um, communication skills which I think are quite rare that people have that and quite often even in a situation where people say I'm in an open relationship we always go home together and we're happy together but every now and then we go off and do something with somebody else and we keep it safe and we're okay with that usually what's happened in my personal experience just speaking for myself is somebody wants to do that and the other person doesn't really but they just say what the other person wants because they want to stay with them and then then that becomes problematic in a different way but you know that's relationships in general I don't think that's anything to do with gay relationships just going back to the consequences thing do you think maybe because some establishments such as religion don't accept people in the gay community they don't then face that consequence so that then makes it easier to do something like that so do I think that because so gay sex isn't included within religion in the first place traditionally that that's made it outside of that look that's a really interesting question what I what I do know is that if you ban anything so now in pornography in the UK it is now not available to show this list of whatever it is ten things that they've just brought in as legislation are those things going to disappear out of online pornography? Of course they're not. They're just going to get more difficult to access and then immediately what you create is a black market and a niche market and then people have to do something a little bit dodgy to get it, like drugs or anything else. You, you know, banning anything and trying to make it go away hurt has never, ever worked and it always creates a subculture that is outside of the mainstream so I think that is a really interesting question that you've got there that are the allegedly promiscuous gay uh, attitudes um, sorry just due to see Charlie uh, is it something to do with the fact that that wasn't included in the moral um, handbook of society I, I don't know I don't know that's a really interesting question and I guess now we've got same sex marriage um, l legally available in our society we may not know the answer to that question for 20-30 years now that would be really interesting that, the, the question that you're asking now is something that in 30 years we'll be able to look back and, and go all right so if we look at the same sex marriage statistics compared to um what do you call it mixed what do you call it normal i would say normal Heteros let's just say heteros if you compare gay marriage to heterosexual marriage statistics over 30 years from now and then we go oh actually the divorce rate is hardly any in same sex marriages whereas it's now something like two out of three well that would be very interesting well we don't know do we well, that's impossible to know at this point in time I think whenever even though I'm in a monogamous relationship and I believe in monogamy that doesn't say I don't agree <clears throat> and I don't fight or would want um, marriage equality because for me that's that's not I think we should have our own that's marriage is part of religion which is part of this straight bubble and I feel like we should have something different to symbolize yeah, well, I, I, that does exist now, doesn't it? I mean, civil cer uh, you can have a serial civil ceremony now that you're in and out of a registry office in 20 minutes and basically what you're doing is saying we're joining our worlds together financially in a, uh, uh, you know, in the event of a splitting up there would be something in place to deal with it that's a very sort of matter-of-fact thing 
so you either get the kind of religious white wedding traditional thing or you go and tick a box in a registry office well I, I think you're right I think I think the gay world absolutely should come up with their own ceremony that is ne not necessarily either of those things but I mean that's almost that sort of tempts the kind of cliche of like well it should be even better and more fabulous than a normal white wedding shouldn't it <laughs> obviously I mean that's another cliche isn't it you know not all gay people are camp and want a fantastically fabulous wedding darling I mean the whole thing's riddled with cliches I mean that's what you're struggling with is you're just a bloke who happens to have certain aspects of your character identity personality parked in something that people assume a lot of things about you for that but uh, you know at the end of the day we're all just people we all just want to be happy we all want pretty much the same things most of us when it comes down to it it just gets really really complicated because we live in complicated times